Hello, everybody. So today I'm going to take things back to basics and basically remake a video that I made a really long time ago, one of the first ones I ever made about how to make a sequencer in Max with phaser, subdiv, what, and stash. The reason I started making these videos to begin with was that I wanted to explore these concepts, basically, uh, because with Max 8.3, a lot of these objects came out and they opened up a kind of new way of working with time within Max that I thought was very interesting. I still think that this is one of the best ways to get into Max and one of the best ways to get interesting and unique musical results out of Max quickly as a beginner. Because the kinds of things that you can do once you get your head around this way of working with time are really unique and there just aren't a lot of tools out there uh, that can do things like this. So consider this video your sort of induction to this way of working with time in Max. If you've seen my videos before and you've watched a lot of them, a lot of this will be a review. Uh, and of course, it's important to keep in mind that this is really just the beginning. So there's, there's way more to this. You'll find, I think, in this particular case that the capabilities of this particular sequence are not totally exciting, uh, but we need to start somewhere and it really does get pretty cool uh, once you master these fundamentals. So let's dive in. Let me show you this and then I'm gonna delete it and then we'll just rebuild it from scratch going through each of the components step by step. So I'm gonna start it here. We have a transport that's in charge of, um, uh, you know, storing the, the BPM. And then we have a phaser that will start to create a clock signal when the transport is started. We then have a sub div, which is giving us a 16th note pattern. And we can omit some of those events using this step sequencer interface here. We've drawn out a melody with the sliders here on the multi slider. And we're storing those inside of a stash object. And they're being read back by this basic accumulator with what? And it's actually, there's an even simpler way to do this, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And then mc.midi player basically converts the signals that we're working with here into MIDI that we can either send outside of Max, or in this case, I'm just sending them to this uh, new device, a uh, new object, which is the Max object version of the Ableton Drift synth that came out in Live 12, I think. All right, so let's delete everything except the synth and we'll start over from scratch. So first we'll create the transport. Transport is really just in charge of setting the BPM and kind of managing timing across the whole patch. But the thing that actually generates the clock is gonna be the phaser. And the phaser is just a general purpose uh, sort of sawtooth waveform that we don't really use for generating audio. So there is a saw object if you wanted to make a sawtooth wave, but phaser is used for timing, but it is ramp shaped or sawtooth shaped. And uh, you can set the frequency with it in Hertz if you want to, like one Hertz, but in this case, we'll use uh, the note syntax or the, the, the kind of musical timing syntax so that we'll set the frequency of this to be one bar at whatever the tempo we have set for the transport. And then I'll set the lock attribute so that when we start the transport by sending it a value of one, we will start the, the phaser clock. And then I can visualize that with a live dot scope. So you can see there, now we have our clock. And this is really the fundamental concept that is unique to this system that is important to understand and that gives us all of the power that this approach uh, contains. And it's this idea that the ramp signal that goes from zero to one is the representation of time. We can think about the time that it takes for this signal to go from the bottom of zero to the top of one as a unit of time, in this case, a bar. And uh, this particular approach is has many benefits, I would say, over a clock that uses a stream of pulses like you might find in a Eurorack system. 
And there's another video where I talk a lot more about this, but the two basic reasons I would say are number one, this clock will always tell you where it is. So if I create a number tilde object, I can see what the actual signal value is. And it will basically tell me what percent of the way it is through the, the bar. The second reason is that it will also be able to instantaneously tell us kind of what the speed of time is. In other words, the BPM, which can be very useful when we want to modify that. And the way that we do that is with the delta tilde object, which tells us the difference between each sample and the previous, right? So in the computer, the any audio signal is just a stream of numbers and the amount of time the amount of those numbers that we get per second is called the sampling rate. And so we can think about the audio as just being a progressive stream of numbers one after the other. And for this particular signal, the difference as the signal is rising from one to the next is this very small number. And this we can really think about as being basically exactly the same thing as the BPM. Uh, and this can be very, very useful later on when we want to say, modulate this slope and get some different, uh, different grooves, swing different feelings of time. The final thing that this phaser signal makes very easy compared to a pulse style signal is the ability to subdivide. So I'm going to do that with the subdiv object, although if you wanted to just do it with plain math, that'd be very easy as well. And we're going to take this phaser that represents a bar and we're going to split that into 16 segments representing 16th notes. This object will also tell us which of those segments it's currently on as both the signal and also as an integer, which is very handy in cases where you need that. So now we have some concept of like a 16th note kind of pulse. If we wanted to go a step further and really make this into a train of pulses, we can use the watt object to do that. So subdiv subdivides a phaser signal. And then what does many things, but in its most simple, it takes a phaser signal and fires off a pulse when that phaser reaches its end slash beginning. The first thing that we can do here is kind of build the step sequencer part of the, of the sequencer. So I'll create a matrix control object with one row and 16 columns. And I'm going to turn the auto size attribute on so that these dots are all nice and round. And this object, when you click the cells, gives you some information from the left outlet. I don't really care what that is. I'm just going to use it to be able to ask the object to tell me what the full contents of that row is. So it's just a, a little trigger that we use to then get the full list. I can then use this directly as the prob message to subdiv which feeds in a set of probabilities for each of these subdivisions. In this case, we're not going to use values other than zero and one, but when we use just zero and one, we're effectively making a little step sequence by omitting some of these ramps that come out of subdiv. Now, if you're looking closely, one thing that you may have noticed is that the what object actually gives us a pulse both at the beginning and the end of these slices which is not really what we want. We just want to get one pulse for each one of these little mini ramps. And so we can fix that by setting the trigger mode attribute of what to one, which basically says, does the signal need to be increasing, decreasing, or both for the impulse to fire? By default, it will allow the pulse to fire in either signal direction, but if we set it to one, which, allow, which only triggers on the descending direction, then we get pulses when the ramps end. Okay, so now we have a train of pulses and we can already see how this is starting to look like a sequencer. But let's uh, next build a melody. So the interface that we'll have for that will be a multi-slider 
Uh, the size will be 16. Uh, the range, which uses the <laughs> the attribute name set min max, which I always thought was weird, is 48 to 72. And then we also want to put this in integer mode so that it can't be floating points. And, uh, and then there we have a MIDI sequence. And we're going to stick this into the stash object. And stash basically is just a container for a bunch of numbers that can then be looked up using signals. A little bit like a ZL lookup but in the signal domain. And once I have put some numbers in this stash, reporting them back is actually as easy as just patching an impulse into the third inlet. You can see now that we're working our way over that uh, pattern here. And also we can have it tell us where in the pattern it is. So this is the position and this is the value. And then let's make some MIDI here. So we can use mc.midi player, which is useful for uh, turning these ramp and pulse and signal based sequences into MIDI. And I'm going to set a couple of attributes that I think are just good. The first is Chan mod one. Basically, this just means that everything is going to be sent on MIDI channel one. If you don't, it can sometimes use other channels. Sometimes that's fine, but usually I just use channel one, one to force everything to be on channel one because it's a little bit easier to work with. And then this default duration, uh, we'll go with 0 0.25. So the way that this object works is it wants you to give it a ramp into the first inlet. And when it receives that ramp, which looks like these, it will start the note on when the ramp begins, and then it will send the note off MIDI event when the ramp gets to whatever you have set for the duration, which in this case is 0 0.25. So if we then, uh, if we then look at the output here, we can see we're getting these MIDI event messages. And the 128 is a MIDI note off, and sometimes you'll see 144. Let me print this. 144, 60, 102 is note on note of the note number of 60, which is the default because we have nothing patched in yet. And then the 128 is the note off. If I patch the left outlet of stash into the middle outlet, middle inlet of MC MIDI player, then I'll start to get the MIDI notes. So you can see that we're receiving those now. And now I can actually, if I'm sending MIDI to a ABL device or another type of object in Max that can receive MIDI like a VST, then I can actually just patch it like this. Or at least I thought that I could, but I suppose I can't. Uh, in that case, I'll show you this other approach, which is we're going to convert this MIDI event message into raw MIDI. So the first thing that we want to do is get rid of the MIDI event. And then we will use the iter object to just break uh, these three numbers into separate messages, because that's how MIDI works. It just sends a stream of numbers separately, not together. And then if we actually sent this, just to, to prove it to you, into a MIDI parse object, and we look at what it outputs for us. You can see that it's telling us that we're getting on channel one, these MIDI notes. We can then send that raw MIDI straight into abl.device.drift and get the pattern. One other thing that's really useful to add in here is a MIDI flush object, because sometimes when you stop the sequencer, it will send the note off, but it hasn't yet, or it sent the note on, but it hasn't yet set the note off. So in those cases, we are gonna wanna force it to 
send MIDI note ops for any hanging notes. So we'll just add a MIDI flush here and we can always bang that whenever we need to. Basically, if you stop the sequencer and the synth doesn't stop, then you just click this bang and it will, it will do that. Let's see if we can get it to happen. If I increase this, it will definitely happen. Let's see. Like that, but then I can just turn it off by clicking the bang there. Okay, so that's basically it. Let me just clean up here a little bit. So we can get rid of this. We can put this up here. And we can put this over here. This goes here. Uh, we can put this in an abstraction. Oh, I'm sorry, not an abstraction, a sub patcher, MIDI Fi. And that's our bang to flush. So that really is the basics. One, I suppose, last thing that I would that I may show you here is in this particular mode where we're sending the pulse into stash, we're always just going to advance to the next number that's available in this list. Uh, if you wanted to instead be able to send a number in here that goes to one of these specific items in the list, then you just need to change the mode attribute of stash, which is here. So the mode right now is next, which means when we get a pulse, we'll just advance, but we can also send index, which is uh, going to make it so that this third inlet is looking for an index or a position. And then from there, there's a few things we can do. We can either take these pulses and just add them up to build an index. We can also take the second outlet of uh, subdiv here. And then in this case, we don't even need the, the what actually. So just to prove you to that to you that that's working. The difference there, of course, is that with this one, because we're skipping some of the notes, uh, because of the step sequence here, we're also going to skip the melody note. Whereas with the other approach where we're using the stream of pulses, we're always going to advance one melody, melody note for each event that we get from the sequencer. So if you want this melody that you've created to always go in the same order, regardless of what the pattern is, then you would use the first approach where you have this set to mode zero and you send a pulse. But if you want kind of more of this idea where the event is linked to a note and uh, those are always glued together and melody notes can be skipped when the event doesn't occur, uh, then in that case, you would use this particular approach. So that's basics of building a sequencer with these uh, with these objects. If you want to learn more about these techniques, there's a ton of videos from me on it. I definitely recommend checking out the Fundamentals of Sequencing series where I go through basically each one of these objects one by one and really explain what they do and how they work. Uh, and then going another level deeper is Rhythm and Time Toolkit, which is a package that I made that kind of builds on this family of objects uh, to give you even more power. Uh, and there's videos on that as well. So let me know if you have any questions down below. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.